if you are with us this morning, uh, I'm glad that you're here if you are with us this morning, no doubt about it. Um, but providentially, you have come to a service uh, that's a little bit different, only in terms of what, uh, what we're preaching. Uh, if Typically, if you come here regularly, I preach uh, through books of the Bible. I'm convicted that way, convinced that way, that that, uh, that shapes me and shapes you, that keeps us tethered to the Word of God by His Spirit. But I, and, and, and sometimes we do, we might do series around the Christmas season or Easter season, or sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. Um, but we, I do uh, annually, or almost annually, for the last six years, five of the last six years, I have preached the core values of our church so that uh, those who are members of our church can be reminded about who we're supposed to be or some of our distinctives of this local body. But then also those who have come into our church in the last year and never heard them before, they can, they can also hear that. Or if you're visiting with us today, um, you can say, oh, this is what a local church might be like or what it's supposed to be about. Um, it's, it's not the only way to do local church. Uh, there's other good ways to do local church. But this is the way that our church over the course of time has been convicted of and convinced of and what we're doing. So um, so I want to give you, uh, for those who are new to us, I want to give you a couple things just to sort of tie you uh, even more into what we're doing this morning because um, uh, I, these core values just basically come from the book of Philippians. Um, uh, 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 Ten years ago now, I guess it's been, I, I, I became the interim pastor of the church as Pastor Dan retired, and, I li- and I, so I had to preach, and, uh, and I literally just picked the book that was least offensive and that's the book of Philippians. It's just the book, and literally the, the scholars call it the book of joy um, because it's just, uh, it's just uh, Paul has this great affection for the church. There's not a lot of correction in it and stuff. And I was like, well, I can't get in too much trouble if I just preach for this book, right? And so I, so I preached it. And during that time, be, I, I got the privilege to become the pastor of this church. I'm so thankful for that, uh, like you don't even know. And, um, but through the preaching of that book, I just started noticing things in the context of the book, just themes that ran through it. And, and I put those before the church saying, hey, I think these should be our core values. And this is what we should, this, we, we, should, we should do this. Joy, unity, mission, sacrifice. They weave all the way through. And if Philippians is a healthy church and we want to be a healthy church, a mission church, a, a church of the gospel, then we should just be like these things. And, um, and so uh, I preached them for the first time in 2013. Um, I've preached them every year, but, uh, but the year that we celebrated the 500th year of the Reformation. Um, and then on, on, the, on uh, January the 29th, 2017, our church adopted a new church covenant that affirms these values. So my desire is just to continue to preach them annually to remind our faith family of our conviction and to share with people who are visiting with us, hey, this is who we are. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I want to share with you is maybe some of you might say, well, why would you even preach about core values? Like, does the Bible tell you to do that, or is that, is that important? Well, this is sort of, this is the why. Um, uh, a lot of churches have vision statements. We actually technically don't have a vision statement, but vision statements tell you what you want to accomplish or what you want to become. Uh, uh, mission statements, of which we also don't have one technically, uh, uh, tell you how to achieve the vision. But values tell you who you are while you're on your mission to accomplish your vision. And and I'm sure that we are not alone, as I know that a lot of other churches have core values, but I believe that there is a distinction in the emphasis that we place on them. Because in our capitalistic culture um, that's built on success, it's defined by growth that's based on numbers, In church life, mostly numbers of dollars and numbers of people. And that culture creeps into our church, so we admire and sometimes even idolize those churches who far exceed national averages in quantifiable categories. Uh, I'm not against being ambitious. I'm not against striving. I'm not against having goals. Those things are all fine. But our ambitions and our strivings and our goals ought to be on an eternal scale rather than a temporary scale. And they can never be at the expense of somebody's eternal soul. So if we can keep defining, if this church can keep defining who we are according to Christ as revealed in the scriptures which is the aim of our values, then our church will begin to produce everlasting fruit that will be distinct from our culture. That's the aim. So very practically, what I'm saying is is, is this. When someone says, 
hey, how's your church? Or what's your church like? The, hopefully, the first things out of our mouths won't be numbers. Oh, our church is, what's your church like? It's, it's, oh, it's about 100 people on Sunday morning, and uh, we kind of have a band, and pastor preaches, you know, long or short, or, you know, he's pretty energetic, or he's a nice guy. W- what I hope we say is, hey, what's your church like? I, I hope something just begins to naturally roll out because of who we are. We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty joyful people. Well, we, 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 we aim to be a body that it's, it's pretty together. Man, I, I really, you know, my church, what's our church like? Man, I, I, I just know some people in our church, they're, they're really sacrificial. They really give of themselves. What's your church like? Man, we, uh, we, try to, we try to serve, we try to go on mission, try to live on mission, be on mission as a person, but live on mission and go and that kind of stuff the Bible tells us. So these are the kinds of things that make more sense as I read the scriptures. Like these are the kinds we should talk about, these Christ, exo- and well, why, why is your church like that? Jesus. Because God is like that. that. That's why. And if Christ is lifted up through the changed hearts and attitudes of his people generally, in this church specifically, then he'll draw all people to himself in his church generally and this church specifically. So our, for our core values, find their perfect source in this perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is the most joyful and the most unified and the most missional and the most sacrificial being that has ever existed or will ever exist. So if our church, if this body of people will believe in, will long after, will kneel down before in submission to, will be changed by and will walk with the God of joy, then we will be a church that makes an impact until he comes back. So the first thing I ought to do is convince you that Jesus Christ is the most joyful being ever. That the God that we serve, amongst any other God you might think is is real or true, that he's the most joyful God. And we use the scriptures to do that. And I, and I, and I hopefully you already know the scripture. I hope I've done this enough times. This is time number six. Hopefully you know where I'm about to go. If you don't, that's okay. Here we go. Let me show you from the scriptures that, that, that God is the God who's most joyful above anything else. So Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness. You have hated wickedness. Therefore, because you are like this, because you are eternal and because you are holy, you are righteous, therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Uh, This psalm is a wedding psalm. This psalm is talking about a a king going to get his bride. You're like, well, that's not about Jesus. And I'll say you're right. But wait, there's more. Hebrews picks this verse up in chapter 1 when talking about the supremacy of Christ in all things. And so verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews chapter 1 say, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So, he, that, so the author of Hebrews is setting up Jesus as God. And when you, and when you, when you roll down in that passage, right, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and you get to verse 8, the author of Hebrews quotes this, but the son of, but of the son, Jesus, he says what? He says Psalm 45, verses six and seven. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, the God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus is the most joyful God there is, the most joyful being there is. There, it, he has no peer. He has no companion. If you want to be a joyful person, you need Jesus. Because Christian joy is not like the joy of the world. Christian joy is affection of and for Christ. His person and his works in and over any circumstance. No real Christian tells you their life is perfect. 
That's only a fool tells you that. A real Christian will tell you my life has ups and it has downs. It has real highs, it has real lows. But my joy comes from who Jesus Christ is. And my happiness sort of fluctuates in the context of that joy. See, Jesus taught in the Beatitudes that, that blessed are those or happiest are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those, happiest are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He didn't preach, blessed are those who are fat and happy on righteousness. He said those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. Blessed are those people. Why? Why would those, that, that, that description, those adjectives don't look like joy. They look like struggle and wrestle and lesser than. But it's these people, they're blessed because at the end of the, of, of, of the Beatitudes, he says, rejoice, right? Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward. Wait for it. In heaven. In heaven. Oh, oh, there's something more than this life. Absolutely. This life ain't all bad, but this life surely ain't all good. But there's definitely something more. You rejoice, and I'm glad I have a joy. You can have a joy because there's a reward in heaven. See, eternity, everlasting life with Jesus, not everlasting life by yourself, not everlasting life ruling over your own kingdom, everlasting life with Jesus is the reason for joy forever and the joy today. There has to be this end goal, this everlasting goal of life with Jesus. Let me give you an illustration. If you remember the, the movie uh, a few years ago, 12 Years a Slave, Solomon Northup was, was taken away, right? He was, a, he was an African-American man living in, in uh, a free life only to be kidnapped and put into slavery. And he concluded a conversation with one of his fellow captives by saying, days ago, I was with my family in my home. Now, today, you're telling me all is lost. Tell no one who you really are if I want to survive. He said, I don't want to survive. I want to live. Uh, it's the same motivation that uh, Mel Gibson's version of William Wallace and Braveheart gives before the men go into battle, right? Riding the horse, face painted. Every, I mean, every ounce of machismo was going on in that moment. And he goes, every man dies, but not every man truly lives. People want life. People want to live. It's inherent in our souls. Why is it so motivating? Why, is, why do we want to be happy and joyful and really live? Because that's the way God designed us, man. He wants us to really live. Uh, later in that movie, later in that movie, in, in, in 12, 12 Years a Slave, after his place as slave is solidified, in a scene on the front porch of his slave quarters, he says, I will not fall into despair. I will keep myself hardy until freedom is opportune. Well, this, this sounds like a Christian idea. It's in that great determination that lies this great question. When or where is the opportunity for real freedom? In this life, for us, we, we sometimes know happiness. We sometimes know despair. Uh, but what we really want is to really live and be happy and be full. How do I get that? Where's the opportunity for that kind of freedom? Listen, the answer to that does not start with where and when, but who? Jesus. If you know Jesus, the question, be, uh, the, the question becomes, where can't you find the joy of everlasting freedom? If you really know Jesus, if you, if, you, if you understand that he's the savior of the world, the God of all gods, the Lord of your own soul, if you know Jesus, the question is, when can't you experience the everlasting joy of Jesus? If you're looking for joy, 
in anything else but Jesus, you will discover in this life or the next that your searching is absolutely, utterly in vain. If the joy is not eternal, it will be revealed as valueless. Not everybody who's a member of our church is always happy. That's the truth. People have walked with me in this church when I have not been happy. I have walked with people in this church when they have not been happy. And what has sustained us in that time is the joy Jesus promises now and forevermore. Because he doesn't change. He is the most joyful being ever. So how do we tap into that? How do we, how do we live in that? Well, the, the first way is just to understand that Jesus is our joy through the gospel. The, uh, the gospel is just the, the Bible word for like good news, for the, the truth of life, right? Let me give it to you from the Old Testament. Remember, let, let, let the Holy Spirit give it to you through the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 7 through 11. It's a little long, but it's on the screen and, and it's good for us. The he is, is, a, is a prophetic looking forward to the Messiah, to the one who's going to save. So we know now it's about Jesus. Isaiah is prophesying. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Read the account in the Gospels and you'll see that Jesus was very quiet during his, his trials. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, Jesus was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Stricken, the gospel now, stricken for the transgression, big word for sins. This one, this Messiah to come is stricken for the sins of the people. And those people made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, here it comes, Shall the righteous one, my servant, Jesus, make many, that's you and me, to be accounted righteous, that is, given Christ's righteousness, and he, Jesus, shall bear their iniquities. Woo! Need some good news today? Because I know that you know what you've done wrong. The only question is, do you know who you've offended when you've done the wrong? And I know that you can name the person that's an offense to on the, on, the, on the horizontal plane. But I'm wondering if you know today the person you've offended on the vertical plane. Because this one is righteous, but he bears the sins of the unrighteous. And that makes a distinction between Christian and non-Christian. We know the one offended. But the good news does not stop there. Because the one who brings the offense is made righteous by the sacrifice of the one who is righteous. That's your good news today. Once you come to the realization of the offense that you have against God, the gospel of Jesus Christ objectively, truthfully says, I'll make you righteous. I'll give you your life. I'll give you freedom. Uh, R.C. Sproul, who's gone to be with the Lord, has made a great impact in the 20th and 21st century, he, 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 he says it like this. He said, the gospel is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings. And that problem is simply this. God is holy and he is just and I'm not. And at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before a just and holy God and I'll be judged. That's a big truth claim. I believe it's true according to the scriptures. I know it's not the common belief of our day, but that's the reality of the scriptures. And he says, I'll either be judged either on the basis of my own righteousness or the lack of it, or the righteousness of another. 
He has done for me what I couldn't possibly do for myself. But not only has he lived that life of perfect obedience, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the justice and the righteousness of God. The great misconception in our day is this, that God isn't concerned to protect his own integrity. Meaning God is just willing to let things just go on as they are, not a big deal. But that's not the case. People, our culture thinks he's kind of a wishy-washy deity who just waves a wand of forgiveness over everybody. No. For God to forgive you is a very costly matter. It cost the sacrifice of his own son. So valuable was that sacrifice that God pronounced it valuable by raising him, Jesus, from the dead so that Christ, Jesus, died for us. He was raised for our justification, uh, for us to be qualified to be in his presence. So the gospel is something objective. It is the message of who Jesus is and what he did. That's the good news. And, and, and any other thing besides Jesus being creator God, dying for your sins, raising to life to promise you eternal hope so that you can, you can humbly and joyfully surrender yourself to him is not the full gospel. This is the truth, according to the scriptures. So, so we know the most joy by the fact that the Lord has revealed to us the truth of the gospel. But not only that we just know the truth intellectually, that we can, we can parse it out from other religions, we also have been saved by it. It's through our own salvation, our own conversion. Now, I want, to, I want to help you understand conversion through a story in the scriptures of, this, of one of Jesus' apostles named Thomas. See, Thomas was with Jesus for three years. He saw everything Jesus did. He heard everything Jesus taught. He was actually given power along with the rest of the apostles to go and preach that good news, to heal people of their sicknesses, to cast out demons in the name of God so that people would know that this one God, Jesus, is the Messiah to come and salvation only comes through him. He experienced all that. He was a part of that. And, and then the event, right, of Jesus's betrayal and the cross happened. Uh, the event that Thomas was told three different times was Jesus himself told the disciples three times, hey, I'm going to go have to die. Even one time Peter was like, Jesus, you're not going to die. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right? Thomas knows all this. And yet when Jesus dies, Thomas gets mad and, and he refuses. He refuses to believe that Jesus is alive, right? The disciples, uh, uh, the disciples show up because Jesus resurrects. He meets the disciples except for Thomas. The disciples go to Thomas and say, you won't believe it. Jesus is alive. And Thomas's response in John chapter 20, verse 25 says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails have been and put my hand into his side where that, where that spear went, I will never believe. What? Are you mad? Not are you angry, like are you just crazy? That's what we would say, right? I mean, don't you ever hear, talk to somebody like, man, you know, all this Jesus stuff, like, you know, if he was just here, I would believe him, right? I'd buy into it if I could just experience, if I could just actually see him. One time, just one time I would see him. Hey, listen, here's, here's a brother who walked three years with him and knew everything about him and actually experienced the power of him as he goes out and does stuff. And when, when, what, and when what happens that Jesus said was going to happen, he refuses to believe. His heart grows hardened. Eight days later, his disciples are inside. John chapter 20, the story goes on. Thomas is now with the disciples. All the doors are locked. Jesus comes and stands among them and says, peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas. Hey, Thomas. Because Jesus wasn't physically there when Thomas made his declaration of refusal to believe, right? But Jesus heard him. Hey, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? And hey, Thomas, take your hand and put it right here in my side, right where you said you need to put it. Put it right here, Thomas. And Thomas, stop doubting and believe. 
doing? What does Thomas do? Listen, let me tell you what Thomas didn't do. Thomas didn't go into investigative reporter mode. He didn't ask him some theological questions. He didn't, you know, he didn't, I don't, I'm not sure the Bible never even tells us that he actually touched his hands or his side. What he did was cry out. What he did was answer Jesus. And he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Like now you believe it? Three years? Know the power? Know the stuff? And now you want to believe just because you physically see me? And he said, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Ooh, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to you. He's talking to me. So we don't just have a knowledge of the gospel. We've been saved by the gospel. We've been delivered by the gospel. To, to be saved is to have Jesus change your life. When Whether you hear a two-minute presentation on a subway train and, and are saved, or whether you slog through questions for years, the end result is the same. That Jesus Christ is the way, is the truth, is the life. And without him, I'd be utterly lost. If you're here this morning, if you're here in this building this morning, Maybe, maybe you're listening in, in, in the future sometime. That's kind of weird to say out loud. But you could be online listening in the future. If you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Christ, you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of the world, it is possible that you just simply haven't heard the gospel and it is possible that you maybe just don't have enough information. But it's far more likely that you're in Thomas's camp and you just refuse to believe. What you're actually saying is, unless Jesus does what I think Jesus ought to do for me, I will not believe. The question you need to ask yourself is if that is what you're commanding, who's actually king of your life? Is it Jesus or is it you? And if that is you, I want you to know based on the truth of the Bible, that you will never be happier. You will never be more joyful than if you will simply ask Jesus to grant you the faith to believe. He has already done for you. If you were to walk in here and if it was even possible to show pictures of all of our lives and you win the award for the worst life possible on the face of the planet... I want you to know that Jesus Christ has done more for you than you could possibly ask or imagine because he has died for your sin and he has rose again for your sin and he has promised you everlasting life with him if you will believe and surrender your life to him. Stop doubting and believe. We know Jesus through his gospel and we know Jesus through salvation. And we know this most clearly, right? We're a joyful people because we know this through his word. There's an Old Testament book called Nehemiah. It's one of the history books. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, when this dude named Ezra read the book of the law to all the people as they gathered around, right? Right? They, the people of Israel were exiled out of Israel and they were allowed back in to Israel. And they discovered a book of the law and Ezra read the whole book of the law of the people. And once they read the law and explained it to the people, the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And Nehemiah gave them instruction based on God's character of joy. Right, Because they're weeping. They're overwhelmed. They haven't had the law read to them in, 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 in 70 years. And now they're standing underneath it. And this is what Nehemiah says in chapter 8, verse 10. He says, then he said to him, go your way. 
eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Man, it's, it's the word of the Lord that reveals the Lord himself that allows us to have this joy. It's God's holy scripture. It's, it's what he ordained for us to know him by. And, and when we read it and take it in, we read it by faith as the words of God, believing as 1 Peter teaches us that while real men in real space and real time actually pen the words, the Holy Spirit was carrying them along as they're doing it, not in transform with their eyes rolled in the back of their head, but in good, real consciousness, but really, really moved by the Spirit of God to write and pen these things. We believe that by faith. And because of that, when we read it, we're like, oh, this is what God is teaching me about himself. We, don't, we try not to read it to, to we, we, when we read it, one of the results is we know more about ourselves, but we aim not to read it to discover ourselves. We aim to read it to discover who Christ is, because when we know who Christ is, then we perfectly know who we are. Perfectly, I say that tongue in cheek. We know who we are. Because Christ is the definition, right? He's the definition of life. So, so then the other, 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 other people in Scripture pick up on these things, right? The prophet Jeremiah says, he says, he says your words, right? This, this law, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for I am, for I am called by your name, Lord God of hosts. When Jeremiah reads the word, he's full of joy because he feels the Lord calling out to him. You know, I plead and beg with y'all to read your Bibles. I don't read this passage enough. I think I'm gonna start reading this verse every time I tell you to read your Bibles because it's not for a checkoff list. It's because, because when you read the scriptures, the Lord's calling you out. He's telling you he loves you. He's telling you he cares about you. Why are they a joy? Because sin leads to death and the things of the world ultimately lead to death and Jesus gives us life and Jesus' words move us away from sinfulness and sinful hearts and moves us toward his holiness and his uprightness which leads to joy which we just read about to give us real everlasting life. That's why Psalm 119.11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The psalmist is happiest when he's not living in sin against Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God breathed, uh, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Oh, come on. Away from sin and in the presence of God is the happiest, most joyful place you can ever be regardless of your circumstances. We need to be a joyful people. This world needs to be, see a joyful people beyond what the world has to offer. They're going to look at you like you're funny at first because they're gonna ask you really serious questions and you're gonna answer with the Bible and they're gonna be like, what are you doing why do you keep opening this book? Why do you keep quoting some dude named Ezra? I can't figure it out. But they're going to watch your life in practice if you're regularly in the word and they're going to keep wanting what you have because what you have is greater than your circumstances and that's an answer their heart is longing for. Even, even, even Jesus, right? Right? I shouldn't say it like that, but, but, but Jesus in, chapter, in, in Luke chapter 11, verse 27, 28, he has preached these things, he has healed people, and all of a sudden this lady just sort of shouts out from the crowd, she raises her voice, she says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nurse. She's like giving praise, this guy exists and doing these great things. She has a, she has a saving faith, but boy, she sure is glad this dude's making change in the community. And Jesus just shouts out back to her, blessed rather... Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He's like, you want to give blessing to me? But I'll give blessing to you. <laughs> praise God for my mom, but better yet, praise God for the word and keeping that word 
And because in that is life. Church, can we be this? Man, not without the grace of God. Can we be this perfectly? Never. But can we aim for this and strive for this? Sure. I mean, if I ask any of you, if I took a, a quick straw poll and said, hey, you want to be joyful? Nobody's going to say, nah. <laughs> nah, I don't really want to be joyful. I just, I've, I've, I've watched all the cartoons. I've seen Eeyore and he's my model. <laughs> it's, fu- it's funny. But it is funny because it's so ridiculous. Everybody goes, yeah, I want to be joyful. Okay. Well, let's do this. Let's make sure we know what the gospel is. Let's not get confused by false teachings or false teachers or, or things that creep in and stuff like that. Let's, let's be clear. Not, let's, not, let's, be, let's not be super righteous. We got, we got time for that. Let's not be arrogant about things. We don't have time for that. The Lord's against arrogance. Let's not, let's not accumulate a bunch of information and walk around holding our belt buckle going, yeah, I got the gospel. Because that's vanity and it has nothing to do with Jesus. But God cares enough about you and me and about his own integrity to spell it out clearly for us. And that kind of treasure is worthy to be known. And not only known with our minds, but experienced in our lives because not only do we understand it, but we've been transformed and changed by it. It has made a difference in our lives. Not a difference like a good diet or workout program. Like a, good, like a good wealth management system. Not that kind of change. I mean a heart change where why I exist and why I do the things I do is completely different than it used to be. Because health and wealth is still about me. But joy and sacrifice, well, that's about Jesus. Let's be about this, church. Let, let, and let, let's, let's be people of the word. Our, our church... I mean, oh, how, how, do we, how do we apply this? How do we apply this? Our church's joy will come from clarity, not from confusion. What must I do to be saved? The Bible says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then what is it I'm supposed to believe? You should believe that he is the only God That our wrongs are not simple mistakes, but actual offenses against him deserving of everlasting death. You need to believe that. Then you should believe that Jesus took that penalty, that everlasting death penalty. He took all of our sins, all of our sinfulness, and he put it on himself on the cross. And then he rose again to assure us we have everlasting life in him. And then he swapped our heart, our heart as, as the prophets say, he swapped our heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. Living, beating, breathing. And what we do is we respond to such a sacrifice and hope by trusting our physical life and our everlasting souls in him and his work for us. That's the good news. Do you believe that? And if you do, then you're in a good position. You're not perfect. You got lots of work to do, but you are now safe and secure in Jesus. When Jesus teaches us, don't be anxious about anything, by everything, prayer and supplication. It's not a quick fix for your anxiety, but it sure does go all the way down to the bottom of your anxiety and allows you to work at it from bottom up. Because if if you're set with Jesus for all eternity, Not that nothing else matters, but in comparison, what else matters? Our church's joy will come from clarity about the gospel, not confusion with the culture and world and false doctrines. Secondly, our church's joy will come from salvation by Christ alone, not mere experience. Let me read you something that one of our elders uh, sent to me this week. It's, it's from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and, he, and he, he knew that I was preaching joy, and he sent it to me very deliberately for you to hear. He said, how heart-cheering to the believer is the delight which God has in his saints. We cannot see any reason in ourselves why the Lord should take pleasure in us. We cannot take delight in ourselves, for we often have to groan being burdened. 
conscience of our sinfulness and deploring our unfaithfulness and we fear that God's people cannot take much delight in us for they must perceive so much of our imperfections and our follies that they may rather lament our infirmities than admire our graces. That's how we feel. But we love to dwell upon this transcendent truth. This, gl this glorious mystery. What is that mystery? That, that as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so does the Lord rejoice over us. It is written, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Joy over you, thee, you, singing. He has looked upon the world he has made and said it is very good. But when he beheld those who are the purchase of Jesus' blood, his own chosen ones, it seemed as if the great heart of the infinite God could restrain itself no longer, but overflowed in divine exclamations of joy. Should not we utter our grateful response to such a marvelous declaration of his love and sing, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Hallelujah, man. Amen. This is who we're supposed to be. We all know, we all know that we're all mess. We all know what we see in the mirror, and yet God makes us like this, and he rejoices of you. Have you, have you, have you stopped to go, like, like, it's hard. It's hard to stop and go, Jesus, you rejoice over me. It's not easy to do because you know your own hearts, but that's what he does. That's the miracle. That's the joy. That's the exclamation part of it. Because once you come to conclude, once you're convinced, once you believe that your sin is, is, is more dreadful than you thought, but his salvation is far greater than you ever knew, then, then you're like, yeah! You want to sing, you want to shout, you weep because it's so overwhelming. You're like, this is the God of the universe. Man, we gotta be this kind of joyful people. I, I don't need, ah, uh, I don't need. Jesus doesn't need a church that just gets really excited when all this stuff is good. And he doesn't need a church that's, that, 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 that walks away from him when life gets really bad. He needs a church that is joyful because they know they've been saved by the mighty hand of God that never changes. We are not aiming to become experienced junkies looking for the next thrill. We are aiming to become mature in Christ where the experience reminds and reveals the person of Jesus Christ and the saving grace that's only found in him. As we said before, the oil of gladness, the oil of joy that is beyond all his companions is on Jesus and he shares it. Woo! Our church's joy will come from the gospel. Our church's joy will come from being saved. And our church's joy will come from his word, not our works. Listen. When our ladies met yesterday morning, they had a great meeting yesterday morning. About 30 or so ladies showed up just to talk about who they are in Christ and who they are in the context of the church and how they might be involved and stuff. But their time began with Ephesians chapter 2, talking about gospel identity and gospel people and gospel mission and gospel meaning, man. That's what that meeting was about yesterday. When the guys who were doing child care yesterday during the ladies' meeting and blessed be those fellas. Blessed be those guys. Uh, we, we talked about uh, fantasy football, and uh, we talked about uh, the Telestrator game. Uh, but we also talked about our church, and, and we talked about baptism. Just, just for, not, it wasn't the whole time. We were there for an hour and a half. But there was a section of our time. We talked about Acts 19 and baptism and what it means to be baptized and how that works and how that functions and such. It's a good conversation. Just people of the word. It was joyful. Uh, I caught up with one of our members this past week, just hanging out one night, talking, and we talked about family and work and real football, not fantasy. But we also talked about our church and how the word of God is shaping our church and transforming our church and making our church not, not better than all the rest of the churches, but a church that's glorifying God because he's the highest and we're not. His praise will ever be on our lips because his word will forever be in our minds and our hearts. That's the God of joy. Follow him, 
Surrender yourself to him. The things you don't want to give up, I'm telling you, based on the word of God, they are nothing compared to the joys that Jesus Christ has for you. Give them up happily to walk in the joy of Jesus Christ. And we'll be different. We'll be a distinct church, not better than, but we'll just be a church that's driven by Jesus Christ himself. And people will be saved. And lives will be changed. And when we get old, and if we have the privilege to have our minds while we're on our deathbeds, we'll know we'll have never been happier because we are just on the border lines between this life and the next and we know who we're going to see and we know why we're going to see them and we'll be happy